this is a little bit of a spur of the moment video. I just thought that maybe this would be a fun thing to do, so here I am. So I was thinking I might do a little bit of a reading vlog for the book that I'm currently working on. This is Richard Holmes's Coleridge biography, or at least the first half of it. And I thought a reading vlog might be a little bit helpful for this. It might help me retain the information a little bit better. I am only... I'm only seven pages in and already I'm starting to regret my life choices a little bit because I already have the second half of the biography, which is a whole separate book in itself. They're each like 300 pages. So I basically have a 600 page Coleridge biography on my hands and it is so reverent and uncritical of him. And this is the exact same fucking problem that I had with the Christopher Marlowe biography that I read last year. I knew I was in trouble when literally on the first page of this, like of the, the introduction or the prelude or whatever, he's like talking about how like, oh, all these other scholars criticize Coleridge. My aim is to contradict that and make you all revere him. The most radical thing about the present book, the first of two volumes, is simply that it is a defense of Coleridge. I'm fucked. Honestly, like, I kind of wanted a little bit more information on the train wreck that was his life. Like, his personal life was just a fucking disaster. It's just occurred to me that I haven't really explained who Coleridge is or why I'm reading a biography on him, so... I guess I should do that now for your benefit. Samuel Taylor Coleridge is one of the three poets who made up the English Lake Poets. This was a group of literary figures from a period of literature known as the Romantic period. The other two poets in this group were William Wordsworth and Robert Southey. This movement called Romanticism was big in the late 1700s to the mid 1800s in Britain. Romanticism is basically what it sounds like. It promoted this like romantic view of life through art. Um, it focused a lot on influences from nature, individualism, Hellenistic and pagan influences, as well as just a lot of stuff which overall could be considered a part of like classical liberalism. So Coleridge, like the others, was both a poet and a critic. Some of his works that you may have heard of include The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, Frost at Midnight, The Aeolian Harp, and The Lime Tree Bower My Prison. I'm not very big on poetry, okay? I very, very strongly prefer novels, but, um... Coleridge just fascinates me. I have heard that his personal life was just a complete and utter train wreck. And honestly, that's like most of why I want to read about him. I don't know. I don't really know what I'm in for. Honestly, people might never even see this footage and that's okay. I'm just gonna take you along for the ride as I read this. Hopefully you learn something new about Coleridge from this. Yeah, I don't know. I'm gonna go and sit someplace more comfortable so that this is actually like a real reading vlog. The first and most important thing that I've learned about Coleridge in these first seven pages is that he apparently was a mouth breather. <laughs> Basically, even though this book is promising to worship him like Spongebob worships the Krabby Patty, listen to this. His appetite for food and books appeared almost indistinguishable, expressed by an almost alarmingly large mouth, which hung permanently open because he found difficulty in breathing through his nose. This sounds promising. Oh, and apparently he used to like eat a lot of cake, like the food cake. I had to take the tripod down because it was making me nervous. In middle age, the search for a lost mother continued with strange consequences. What does that mean? Okay, I am dying because it's like every single page, there is so much shit happening. First of all, this whole family is fucking insane. So Coleridge is like, my dad is the greatest person in the world and he like idealizes him so much. But his dad just like one day burns all of his like storybooks that he'd been obsessing about and his like beloved copy of the Arabian Nights um and then he sends him off to boarding school like just as like 
to show him what's what, I guess. No real reason. Like, it just says, like, he was doing it for, like, some sort of, like, righteous emotional reason. And there's this anecdote here that says Coleridge's brother Frank would cheerfully sign a letter to his sister Nancy, your affectionate and handsome brother Francis, adding a postscript asking if Mariah Northcote was kept fully informed of his growing good looks. I think a giraffe is trying to climb the stairs outside. First of all, me. Second of all, this is, you guys know that picture that's like, why am I so handsome? What is wrong with me? That's literally Francis. On the next page, what do I find but a violent brawl taking place over cheese? In autumn of 1779, when he was seven, a quarrel took place between uh, Sam and Frank Francis, uh, which throws much light on the psychology of the youngest son who is Coleridge, he's the youngest, um, and which Coleridge himself shrewdly presented as a formative event. It began one October evening in the kitchen of the Vicarage. Sam, typically demanding, had asked his mother to prepare him some special sliced cheese for toasting. Frank stole in and minced it up to disappoint the favorite, and a violent fight ensued. Fifteen years later, Coleridge still entered into the drama as he wrote, I returned, <laughs> saw the exploit, and in an agony of passion, flew at Frank. He pretended to have been seriously hurt by my blow, flung himself on the ground, and lay there with outstretched limbs. I hung over him, moaning and in great fright. He leaped up and with a hoarse laugh gave me a severe blow in the face. I seized a knife and was running at him and when my mother came in and took me by the arm, I expected a flogging and struggling from her, I ran away to a hill at the bottom of which the otter flows about one mile from Ottery. This Tom and Jerry ass family, I swear to God. Now that I think of it, Fighting over food is, like, in all seriousness, like, kind of no joke. Like, I know it's, like, a little bit funny that he went after someone with a knife over stealing, like, cheese. I don't know. Like, I, like I'm just thinking about, like, if you've ever had somebody, like, try to withhold, like, food from you as, like, a power play, like, including, like, siblings and within the family. Like, that can be low-key traumatic. And, like, it says here that he literally, like, thought about this incident for the rest of his life. Like, there's a bunch of other stuff, too, that happened after it. So basically what happens is, like, he gets away from his mom and, like, he runs down to the river um, and is, like, on the outskirts of the town. Um, and he almost freezes to death when he's out there and they have, like, a search party going out for him. And they almost don't find him in time uh, because, you know, he wakes up, like, half frozen uh, and too weak to move. Frank, like, picking on him and, like, trying to steal his food. Um, kind of no joke. Like, if you've ever experienced that, I'm sorry that you've ever experienced that. I just got done uh, reading at the gardens for today, and I think we can safely say this biography has moved from territory which I would characterize as funny to territory which I would characterize as dangerously relatable. <laughs> he had this particular fantasy when he was a child that I thought was like unbelievably endearing and it was like he dreams of there being an entire room made out of plum cake so that he could go into it and eat himself a table and chairs and other furniture out of the plum cake. He's at college now. Did that really just happen? I think they just fucking hit somebody's car right behind me. What the fuck? Um, 
Anyway, I might have to move if that scene gets to be too much. The biggest thing that I'm getting out of this is that Coleridge grew from a kind of moody and I guess like needy for attention child into like an attention seeking adult person with just a need to like please people. So he goes to Jesus College in Cambridge. Here's an interesting anecdote um, that brings us into dangerously relatable territory. In his letters to George, his brother, um, and especially to the Evans family, there is an overwhelming evidence of his passionate desire for intimacy and acceptance. The almost hysterical intensity of this, at times, may itself have been an alienating factor for fellow students. Self-dramatizing and self-mocking by turns, he was like some brilliant, overgrown child, performing ceaseless, exhausting parlor games for his elders and never settling down. He danced and jumped on his own shadow, sitting scholarship exams, writing for poetry prizes, dabbling in university politics, running up disastrous debts, flirting with drink, whores, and suicide, and all the time seemed to know that the performance was somewhat hollow, a dazzling demand for attention, sympathy, and recognition. Is that not the realest shit you've ever heard in your entire life? Like, I'm sorry, that is some of the realest shit that I've ever heard in my entire life. He really does sound like a Donna Tartt character, and in reading this, the incredible thing to me is how similar so many, like, literary geniuses really are to each other. Like, he has a history of Greek. Um, it is just, like, incredible to me that there is this, like, classical background that seems to call to, like, like, all literary greats. Like, I just find that really interesting. He's, uh, extremely paranoid about physical inferiority, uh, bad teeth, um, but he's not small. He's very larger than life. He has this loud voice, um, this need to perform and impress, and he is very, very big. Like, he's just a big person. Big features, too. Like, he has a big mouth, uh, big eyebrows, big eyes. Um, just a very large, shambling young man, according to this book. Already writing poetry at Jesus College, French Revolution starts, and this is what brings him into a little bit of political radicalism and um, agnostic kind of thoughts. Yeah, but there's just a lot of just political stuff happening on campus. He's flirting with the Jacobinical party, and he is somewhat embarrassed about this. He denies it in public statements after 1800. Yeah, brilliant classical scholarship, flamboyant talk, and peculiar political views, it says. But he's already having problems. He began to live a kind of double life at Cambridge, his wild expenditure on books, drinking, violin lessons, theater, and whoring, alternating with fits of suicidal gloom and remorse. Is that not every single person in college? In September of 1793, he gave up all attempts to get his affairs under control, um, and he throws caution to the wind and decides to just make all his problems worse. He abandoned himself to a whirl of drunken socializing, alternating with grim solitary resolutions to shoot himself as the final solution to bad debts, unrequited love, and academic disgrace. He reenacts the cheese incident. Um, so there is something that happens. So November 1793, he basically runs away and awaits discovery and rescue with inward and gloomy satisfaction. So he's kind of reenacting that uh, one night as a nine-year-old when he runs away and awaits for either death or for the townspeople, someone who cares or whatever, to, um, to find him. And then he gets upset even more because he thinks that all of his whoring has gotten him some kind of STI. And then he runs off and joins the military without telling anybody, even though he possesses a total inability to ride a horse. I find it interesting that even though this book pretends like it's just venerating him, there's this quote on page 56 where it says, he makes the worst of everything brilliantly. He is discharged from the military because he is insane. Afterwards, he meets Robert uh, Southey, and they come up with their batshit pantisocratic scheme, where they basically say, we're going to go and start a communist commune in Kentucky so we can live like free of corruption and live this idealistic uh, life. And he goes on his first walking tour. I love his relationship with Southey so much. So Southey is a virgin. Coleridge like looks up to this and he says that this trait 
uh, of Sotheby's was admirable and it converted him away from sexual promiscuity. There also is this moment where um, Coleridge on his walking tour, he has this like stick in the mud friend, uh, Hux, I think his name is, with him there. And, uh, you know, speaking of sexual promiscuity, while they're on their walking tour, they come across a group of nude women bathing. Basically, Hux retreats and is like, I'm just gonna go a little bit farther up the river. Coleridge continues to look disrespectfully. I also found, I didn't know that Southey had ever cross-dressed. Kind of interesting. They, despite their severe personality differences, they are f going full speed ahead with Pantasocracy. Pantisocracy. I am probably not going to read much more today because um, I have a bunch of errands that I need to run. Pantisocracy has collapsed, and Coleridge has married with Sarah, and he's officially met William Wordsworth, and immediately after getting married, he is back on his political bullshit again. Um, I think that that's, like, what keeps surprising me about this, and what I, like, low-key find so immensely relatable is the fact that he gets older and he gets more domestic and settled down and he can't seem to put down this need to pick fights with people and to start shit and like fight for the causes that he believes in. It looks like, it seems like every time he picks up this kind of conflict, at least so far, um, he ends up having other troubles in his life. Like right here ends up getting drunk publicly drunk. Like right here it says, for the next five months he dedicated himself to this cause, science, freedom, and the truth in Christ, and severely disrupted his domestic life in the process. It's like he can't handle stability almost. And again, we are reaching territory which I find, um, shall we say, dangerously relatable. <laughs> I didn't expect to be so soft for this when I'm reading it, but oh my god, I feel like I'm reading a little bit, like I'm reading a psychological profile of myself. Surely I should not be relating so hard to this centuries-old man who everybody re uh, remembers as the most pathetic literary figure to ever live, but that's just the way that I feel. I find it super duper interesting that out of the pair of them in his marriage, Coleridge was the one who was saying that wives, the ideal wife, should be the free and equal companion of her husband. He was a supporter of the feminist views of Mary Wollstonecraft. This is news to me because I always thought that he was a sexist because of something that he said uh, in a letter to one of the Bronte sisters about like ignoring her womanly duties to write or something like that. Wonder if that comes when he's older, when he becomes more conservative. But it was Sarah, his wife, who just wanted traditional domesticity from the start. And of course, this has created a situation where Coleridge is having this explosion of literary activity, this explosion of creativity after his marriage, because he's happy and he's married, so of course he wants to produce things, but family and financial responsibilities are closing in on him and he just can't fucking take it. I regret to inform you that out of the pair of these two, it absolutely is Coleridge that I relate to more in this situation. Like, and I, it pains me, but I am fucking fascinated by this kind of dynamic. I also relate to Coleridge because literally everything in his life comes down to cheese. He is in this cottage uh, living with his wife now and um, it's like a period of like relative peace, but he's having a problem because the cottage is super cheap and they have mice. And so now he has this kind of problem where he likes animals, like he has a fraternal attitude towards animals according to this uh, biography. Um, and there's a note here 
that says, perhaps he felt some real kinship with his devilish mice cheated of their cheese. So he doesn't want to try to trap the mice by luring them with cheese because it would remind him of the day uh, that he got cheated out of his cheese by his brother. So Coleridge and Wordsworth are very close friends now. Um, they are in Germany together, and tension is kind of everywhere in Coleridge's social life. Um, so there's tension with Sarah, um, because Coleridge is just being a little bit, um, it's not like completely clear and like we'll never really know, but like this biography theorizes that it's because Coleridge, like, like, Sarah can kind of tell that he's not super into the domestic thing and that, you know, it's not his priority. And he is still obviously traveling all over the place with Wordsworth and making up all kinds of excuses to get away from the domesticity. Kind of shocked to find out that Southey was involved in a circle. It was like an, like, specifically an anti Coleridge circle, which, a little bit middle school. Um, but yeah, I was really surprised about that because there hasn't been a whole lot of Southey in this book, and the last time I saw him, he and Coleridge were planning the Pantisocracy uh, commune together, so that's kind of crazy. Then even Wordsworth, there is like one weird thing where they split up in Germany and then Wordsworth doesn't write to him for six weeks, and Coleridge calls the silence ominous. I think this biography actually does point it out at some point about how people, when they meet Coleridge, they become like instantly enchanted with him and then suddenly it just burns out, like it fizzles out and then they don't like him anymore. I mean, I've read a lot since I checked in last. Uh, I'm on like page 212. There hasn't been a whole lot. A lot of it has just been things that I'm not super interested in, like business ventures and like very minute like things from the publishing world that just like aren't really of interest to me. I care more about his personal life. But Coleridge, for the past few chapters, has been just overnight super conservative and super religious and like, you know, like kind of... It's just a little bit of like penitence in it, isn't there? Like, he's like at home and just like tilling his garden with Sarah. He's like, ah, oh, yeah, this is what life is all about, baby. And it's just like, like, you know, trying very hard to fit like this traditional role and then running away from home every two weeks on some insane scheme that he has co like cooked up. Because, like, he, he can't fit into the traditional role. Like, he just can't. Lots, lots of interactions with the church. Just, it seems like it hit really suddenly in this. And I just found it really surprising. Also found it so surprising how suddenly he started being, like, like, speaking out against the libs. Like, Coleridge, that was you a, a year or two ago. Like, shut up. He's, like, obsessed with how, like, conservative he is now. Like, just, like, walking, talking, just good, good Christian man, even though he is um, apparently doing some really heavy drinking and um, a lot of opium already. Really disturbing developments, and it, it's, I'm trying to figure out what the hell prompted it, because, well... It might have been the marriage, actually, now that I think about it. I don't know what I'm going to do with this footage because I am not in a filming state right now, as you can very much see. Um, however, I have to get this down because if I don't, then I'm just, I'm not gonna remember everything that's happened. So Coleridge is really loitering in getting home to his wife and I'm starting to be like, I'm starting to have a little bit of a problem with it, to be honest. And Sarah, basically, Coleridge's wife, 
has been hanging out with her sister a lot, who is uh, married to Southey. And Southey, snake that he is, has been adding on to all of the um, doubts that all of that has obviously catalyzed in Sarah towards her husband, and he's just been building on it. So he's been, like, like instilling doubts in her about Coleridge's ability to write, his ability to provide for the family. Like, it is so much... And because Southey has been taking care of Coleridge's wife while he's been gone, which, by the way, while Coleridge was gone, one of his children died. And he didn't even rush home. Like, he, like, stayed out. Literally, the mess is so bad. And so, basically, now Coleridge is indebted to Southey, even as Southey is, like, like shit-talking him behind his back. And Coleridge is, like, plagiarizing now, according to this biography like it's going to be talked about more in the second half of the biography sarah hutchinson has moved into the picture so coleridge has a crush on another sarah he says he's in love with her and somehow when he gets back home his wife is pregnant again you don't even like her anymore. Why are you getting her pregnant again? I simply don't understand. I feel so bad for Sarah. I'm starting to get done with Coleridge. I don't know. I think I don't like him as much anymore. I liked him better when he was younger. Now I'm just a little bit... Like, he is being so shady and shitty. I kind of can't wait for it all to start going to shit for him. <laughs> Okay, to be completely honest, I'm starting to hate him a little bit. Like, just a little bit. If this biographer's goal is to make me start to hate Coleridge, he's really succeeding. He's so egotistical. He's got all of these projects and he's following through on none of them. He's just like pushing his wife to the wayside. I understand having problems with like domesticity. Like, I get that. I get having commitment issues. But he is being so unbelievably callous and cold to Sarah. They're barely even together. Like, he never even like sees her. And then he gets her pregnant again. Like, can you imagine being Sarah in that situation? And just like, he drops in, gets you pregnant again, and then leaves again. And I bet you, like, I'm just like picturing this from her perspective, right? Like, you've been brought up to like think that like marriage and like your fairy tale marriage to some gentleman is like the height of all happiness and that is going to be the happiest thing in your life is like being a wife to a husband and like having his babies and blah 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 and she wakes up and finds herself in this fucking situation with this guy who first of all doesn't know how to lower his gaze right He's like setting his sights on this other Sarah. And second of all, he's never fucking there. Third of all, he's broke as fuck. Like he is so completely entrenched in his own little world, in his own little egotistical fantasy that like, like I, I can't help but find it disgusting. What about Sarah? This, this channel is the number one Sarah Fricker defense squad because she did nothing wrong. She never asked for any of this crazy shit, right? When a man proposes to you, you presume it's because he likes you the best and wants to be with you, right? Why the fuck would you propose if you don't even like her that much? I, I actually... The numbers actually aren't adding up. And frankly, it's just like crazy to me that Coleridge is like, oh, I'm like, I've, I, I've grown now. Like I, I'm, too, I'm too grown for liberalism and blah, 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 blah. But then he acts like literally like a 14 year old boy in his marriage. Can you imagine how scared she must be? Like she has had two serious, two or three serious miscarriages at this point. She has had a child die when Coleridge still wasn't there. I'm, I'm like a Sarah stan now, actually. Sarah is the only one I stan. I think she should have just probably killed Coleridge. It's not like he was producing any work anyway at this point. Like literally failed commitment after failed commitment. You're just plagiarizing now to get shit done. 
We can only pray that Sarah was like sleeping with Sadi or something, right? We can only hope that she was having affairs with other men. I pray to God that she started to get selfish at some point and just started living her best life and like stopped waiting for Coleridge and instead just became a leech on him for what little money that he had. I guess he put her in the Lake District. So I guess, you know, there's that. That's the one good thing. I would probably forgive a man many things if he put me in the Lake District. Also, it mentions in here that Coleridge had a dressing gown with Egyptian hieroglyphics on it. And I just want to say, why is every writer the exact fucking same? Because I shit you not, if you have seen my old videos, you know that I used to have like a giant decal of the Egyptian god Set just like on my like dining room wall in my apartment. First of all, I want a hieroglyphics dressing gown and I, I, but I'm embarrassed that Coleridge had one too. Oh my God, this fucking line. On the 14th of September, Sarah gave birth to a boy at half past 10 in the evening. For once, Coleridge was present. Oh my God. Coleridge and Wordsworth are like collaborating together on like the lyrical ballads. This was a project that they were working, a, a poetic project that they were working on together. Listen to this. What had happened was clear. Wordsworth from a position of apparent weakness had ruthlessly come to dominate the terms of the collaboration. Having used Coleridge, even one might think having exploited him as advisor and editor, drawing him up to the lakes for that very purpose, he had entirely imposed his own vision of the collection on the final text, the extraordinarily dismissive note which he now attached to Coleridge's poem, The Mariner, further bears this out. And the note on the bottom of the page? Holy shit! And Coleridge didn't see it before it appeared in print in the second edition. It read as follows. The author was himself very desirous that the ancient mariner should be suppressed, this wish had arisen from a consciousness of the defects of the poem and from a knowledge that many persons had been much displeased with it. The poem of my friend has indeed great defects. First, that the principal person has no distinct character, either in his profession of mariner or as a human being who, having long been under the control of supernatural impressions, might be supposed himself to partake of something supernatural. Secondly, he does not act, but is continually acted upon. Thirdly, blah, 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 and he's just like listing the fucking flaws. What the fuck? The girls are fighting. Oh my God, this man is becoming a human disaster. So he's plagiarizing again. He is now going on these long walks where he is out of his mind on brandy and opium. Oh my god, Sarah Hutchinson is back in the picture. First of all, Coleridge is in such bad shape right now. Like his eye, like he describes his eyes as just being bright red because his eyes are just always inflamed and infected now. And he's got like boils all over his neck for some reason. And he has really bad rheumatism at this point. Clownage to chase a married man who looks like that. Sis. Just go after Southey. If if you're into the married men, go after Southey. Like this, this is just pathetic. Like you are gonna go for this bottom of the barrel. Just, I, I can't, I like really can't. And like the fact that the Wordsworths are like encouraging this and like cheering it on. He gives her a Christmas present. He gives her Anna Seward's original sonnets. He inscribed lightheartedly to Ashara, the Moorish maid. I think I need to go and like throw up because this is, this is such Reddit bro behavior. So Coleridge is hanging out with other Sarah 
and other Sarah's sister act acting like a little boy. Like he's acting like such hot shit and like talking about how like, like I feel like I deserve physical tenderness, right? Like talking shit. Everyone is talking shit about Sarah. Everybody is talking shit about Sarah. Dorothy Wordsworth is like, oh, she's not, she's just not warm and loving enough. Why the fuck do you think that is? Like, hmm. If, if only there was a reason for that. Man, isn't it crazy how like women just like act in certain ways and there's literally no reason for their actions whatsoever, no possible explanation? Listen to this shit. So this is shit Coleridge wrote. She's uncommonly cold in her feelings of animal love. I wonder if anything might have happened to make her behave that way. Like, I just wonder, is it possible that like maybe something happened to her to make her behave that way? You know, something extremely traumatic, like um, the abandonment of the person who under oath and under God swore his life to her or you know, the death of a child and the subsequent second abandonment. Man, I, uh, I wonder if anything kind of like extremely irrevocably traumatic like that may have happened to her to make her behave coldly. I wonder. There's no easy way to say this. But Coleridge is a boob guy. I don't know if you all are familiar with the boob guy versus ass guy discourse or if you're normal, but basically the discourse is that if you're an ass guy, you're normal. And if you're a boob guy, you've got some problems. <laughs> it's not looking too good for Coleridge. Also, I could have lived a very long and happy life without having to read about Coleridge's masturbatory fantasies, but I guess I can't really unsee that now, can I? You know, I think the greatest tragedy in all of this is that Sarah Fricker will never be able to listen to can the mans join them? This is actually so upsetting and awful. So he and Sarah had an actual confrontation now and he threatened to leave her first. Yeah, and apparently they were both shouting at each other. And what came of it is that she basically was like, okay, fine, I'll start acting like a wife and mother. So he emotionally has been terrorizing her for however many years of their marriage, right? He has been putting her through just traumatic abandonment after traumatic abandonment. And now it's her behavior that has to be fixed. She reacted completely rationally. Coleridge is a horse's ass. I actually don't feel sorry at all for making fun of your little cheese trauma that you had as a little kid. You fucking deserve that and more, especially if you were gonna choose to turn into this kind of fucking monster. A solemn prayer that Sarah was cheating on him. Listen to this shit. Mrs. Coleridge was made serious and for the first time since our marriage, First of all, that already is a lie because they literally, it's recorded in letters that they had plenty of happy times immediately after they were married. It was only after their first child when Coleridge like started acting like a piece of shit absent father that they started having problems, AKA they had literally no problems in their marriage until he started to act like an asshole. Like everybody is just like, oh, they're not evenly matched and blah, blah, blah. No, the problem is that one person is in it who literally is just like choosing to not grow up. Like Coleridge has fucking Peter Pan syndrome and he doesn't know how to be constant. And he just needs to be praised and petted like a little fucking boy for the first time since our marriage, she felt and acted as beseemed a wife and a mother to a husband and the father of her children. 
She promised to set about an alteration in her external manners and looks and language and to fight against her inveterate habits of thwarting an unintermitting dispathy. This immediately and to do her best endeavors to cherish other feelings. I'm just going to say it. Coleridge, no one cares about your feelings. Okay, I'm sorry, but normal, healthy, well-adjusted adults aren't so fucking obsessed with their own feelings being cared about. Like, adults get their security from within themselves and that's where we fucking, that, that's just like where we get our security from. We don't need other people to coddle our feelings 24 fucking seven. Sarah, you can come here and sit with me, okay? Because like this, Sarah needs, also I hate that all the women around Sarah are just being like pieces of shit and like no one is helping her, okay? That is not the girl code. I, on my part, promise to be more attentive to all her feelings of pride. He's lucky that he's not alive anymore. I'm, I am so mad. I'm so mad. I almost don't want to keep reading this. I'm almost done though, so I, I guess I'll just keep going. Coleridge is plagiarizing again, and now he's shitting himself in addition to everything else. Um, he's also begging Sethi to come and uh, spend time at Greta Hall. He is dreaming up all of these ridiculous literary projects, and Sethi responds to him. As to your essays, etc., etc., you spawn plans like a herring. I only wish as many of the seed were to vivify in proportion. Where is the lie? I like am having trouble even reading this. Coleridge says to Sarah, in sex acquirements and in the quantity and quality of natural endowments, whether of feeling or of intellect, you are the inferior. He also expressed the wish that other Sarah might attend Sarah, his wife, on her lying in, because you will hardly have another opportunity of having her by yourself and to yourself and of learning to know her such as she really is. So I'm going to send the other woman to be with you when you give birth, because we both know I won't be there. And because I spend so much time with the other woman, this is the only time that you'll get to know her for who she truly is, you judgmental bitch. This is like so evil, it's making me feel sick. Mm, okay, so I have officially finished the first half of the Richard Holmes uh, Coleridge autobiography. And by first half, I mean this book itself is the first half. I am flabbergasted, to say the least. <laughs> It's insane how much, how human this is, like how utterly human it is. I was just overwhelmed by this the entire time. I think in spite of the fact that I found Coleridge to be extremely distasteful in around the second half of this book, it is insane how much Holmes manages to like bring his humanity through. I, I'm a little bit heartbroken. It just is like a heartbreaking biography. Um, I found him to be so lively and sublime in the first half of it, and then the second half of it, you know, he's plagiarizing and he's being emotionally manipulative to his wife, and I honestly can't stop thinking about that this one line that he wrote to a friend in a letter about Sarah uh, Sarah Fricker, not the Sarah he was having an affair with. And it was something like, like, talking about the evil day that he met his wife. And Holmes is brilliant because Holmes has, of course, presented us the truth of that evil day, where Coleridge is talking nonstop about how it's the happiest he's ever been and the best day of his life. And he loves his wife so much and she's perfect. So much also about just what the constraints of the nuclear family can do to somebody um, because, you know, Coleridge clearly was, at least in my opinion, he clearly was not the sort who ought to be constrained um, in that kind of format. Like, he clearly 
is one of those men that can't handle the responsibility of having a family. And that's not a moral judgment coming from me. It's just that some people are kind of these very, like, free agent types. And I absolutely am this kind of person, so absolutely no judgment. You know, some people literally are not built to have the responsibility of other people's lives in their hands. And it was horrifying to watch as he began to resent the restrictions of the nuclear family and of his responsibilities that he had kind of willy-nilly taken on because it's like it seems like he kind of got married despite his happiness with Sarah at the beginning it seems like he did kind of get married because it was the thing to do. Coleridge has invented the um commie to smug heterodox liberal pipeline. <laughs> I think that's how I worded it in my Goodreads review. He literally is that because he had all these radical ideas and now he's like well actually um that's his whole damn personality in the second half of it of this it's well actually um was that a knock no it wasn't it was really regrettable to read some of the contents of his letters the way that he spoke to his wife oh my god the contrast between him in the beginning having this idea that in his ideal marriage a woman is equal to a man and then later him writing this unbelievably abusive letter to his wife where he is telling her basically never forget that in all things you are my inferior and i also was struck by how fast things happen to him in this how how quickly the opium addiction and the hard drinking snuck up on him as soon as he started getting into the conservative shit like i'm not trying to create a dichotomy or anything between conservative or liberal what i am trying to do is say that I, I think that the conservatism for Coleridge was a little bit entwined with his life coming apart and trying to get a semblance of control and trying to appear poised and not like a messy radical. The fact that that came hand in hand with the extremely heavy drinking and the opium and him like literally shitting himself from drugs multiple times. But he was so awful and so abusive that I found myself getting quite angry throughout this. And long story short, short I feel but at the same time I am excited to see the downfall of it all. I no longer feel bad for making fun of Coleridge for the cheese incident because goddamn he really chose to become a giant asshole uh just to cope. That is just the way I feel about this. I would highly, highly recommend this if you are looking to learn more about Coleridge. Yep. That is the end of this reading vlog, and um, I don't really have anything else to say. Um, but yeah, that's it. Bye.
What the fuck? Okay, I'm gonna go wake Victor up. Okay, hello. Um, so, there actually is gonna be a part two to this video. I don't know, kind of improv it a little bit. Um, I don't know why, but since last night I've been just like kind of really possessed by the need to walk really long distances. So, Victor and I are headed into the woods and, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess that's what white people do when scary shit starts happening is just, just go towards the danger. So we're just heading into the woods, hopefully get some good walking done, um, and just see what we're going to see um, in the spirit of, I guess, uh, the old romantic walking tour. So I hope you'll Come along with me for the ride. Just getting a little bit of a creepy vibe, but the sun's been going in and out from under the clouds, so I'm hoping that it gets nicer. I don't know, Victor, how are you feeling? Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. Good. Feeling good. What do you think it's for? Oh, Samhain. Samhain isn't until uh, October. Which one? Wait, what's what's the one that happened? Beltane. Beltane, perhaps. Nothing like a cloudy sky, huh? I mean, partly a cloudy sky, maybe. Okay, it's gonna get dark up here again. Super quiet. Hello? Hello. It's super quiet. I know. I was adding to the, to the mystique. I don't think we need anyone to add to the mystique, babe. Alright. Not like I'm contributing <laughs> much. What? Nothing. Okay. okay. Would you tell me if it was something? I would tell you if it was something. Cause like if you're like, cause I like, right? I would tell you if it was something. If I saw something, I would tell you. Let's just keep we're, we're, it's, we don't have a ton of daylight. Creepy asshole bridge. I remember. I know, I'm tired too. I know. Me too. What was that? It's not funny if you're fucking with me. I'm not fucking with you. Why would I just fucking do that? Something probably just... just fell. 
didn't it, sound it, like you it, thought something just fell. It, it, it fell. It must have fallen. Like, what else, what else could have happened? Well... You know we're in bear country. We're in bear country? Yeah. Well... Well, it doesn't do anything for us to just... Like, I think we should just keep moving. Let's just keep walking, yeah. Uh, did you see something with it, though? I thought... Like... No, well, no, I didn't. Because well, I, I didn't well, even stop because I thought it was, like, just you fucking around. No. Why would I fuck around? So, I don't know. So you like, almost... to mess with me? No. Why would I mess with you? I'm freaked out, too. Th this is stupid. This is really it, stupid. Like, okay, it's just, it's a sunny day. It's I don't nice want, like, warm. yeah, there's no reason to, it's literally, it wouldn't be a bear in the middle of the day. What? What's over here? Nothing. What were you saying? You think you're starting to get frustrated with me? No, not with you. I'm just getting frustrated because someone's fucking with us. Well, that's not frustration. That's like fucking scary. scary. Yeah. So let's just like I don't even care. I think I got let's a, just keep a going. Stick. I don't think a whittled stick is gonna do anything against a hick with a gun, but wow. sure. You got the map, right? Sure. What do you mean, sure? I have a map. I don't know if it's the map. Okay, well, I just want to make sure that, like, you actually know where, yes, I know where, where, where like, yes. okay, where are we? We're, we're on, we're on the trail that is specified on wait, the map. Wait, wait, wait. Squirrel. Just Did you see that? No. I saw a squirrel. Well, no, something moved over there. Uh, yeah, it was a squirrel. But no, see that big log? Like Yes. What did the log move? No, there was something that moved behind it. Huh. Okay, I, I just, like, I hope you know where we're going. Yes, I know where we're going. Come on. Can hear the river. Now yeah, we're getting close to Cheese Rock. Woo! Cheese Rock, baby. Yep. Well, can see why he ran here in his... Darkest moment. In his troubled youth. Yeah. Yeah, it's super low. Yeah, you can see the almost see the bottom of it. Yeah, I know. I think so, and the lighting's, uh, lighting's a lot less um, contrasted. Okay, so my face is like lit this way? Yeah. Yes, I'm going. They went into the woods prepared to find death. What they found instead was a desecration of dignity at the site which trappers often refer to as cheese rocks. On top of the rock formation, the story of the torture inflicted on a nine-year-old Coleridge unfolded. He was without toasting cheese, angry and cold hidden from view by some underbrush overhanging the rock. Bereft and alone, he cried himself to sleep, and when he woke, he could only whimper weakly, too weak to move. He could only hope that some party had missed him enough to start a search. Finally, the men found him, and, entranced by the horror of what had happened, returned him to his waiting family. It is said that on cold nights, the stench of cheese is still thick here, at Cheese Rock. All right, so... Just filmed a little footage at the legendary Cheese Rock, where Coleridge nearly died at nine years old. Um, 
and it's starting to rain so Victor and I are gonna start heading home uh, before the rain gets too bad because it's supposed to start thundering. You got it? Well, my phone's dead. You don't have like a paper map? I bring paper maps around anymore. Well, do you like roughly know where we are? Yeah, of course I know roughly where we are. Okay, so we'll, you'll be able to get us I'll back like to, to us the back. car? Yeah, no, easy peasy. Okay, yeah. okay, don't good. Worry about Victor and I are roughing it. <laughs> But I guess this is what you do for love. You trust people. I think the trees are starting to get less thick. Yeah. You think? That's a good sign, I think. Oh my god. Hey Victor. Uh, Look at this. What is it? What the fuck? I'm like scared to touch it. Don't touch it. It's like, look, it's like all in like... What the hell? It's like all around. What is this? I think the locals are fucking with us. I hope so. I don't. Just like some crazy hick like following us. Some of these are kind of high up for like a kid. Yeah. This one's a car. Well, and this, what is up with this one? Oh my, oh my God. I'd let's keep walking. Let's, yeah, I don't want to stick around here for too much longer. Yeah. Really? Yeah, we can cross this. Yeah, but like... No, we can cross. No, but I don't like it because it's like not on the map. No, like, no. or it wasn't on the map. No, but it's okay because the other the trail on the other side of the river is like the exact same. I know, but like. We can cross it. It'll actually get us back faster. Yeah, but. You I'll know, go first. I. It's okay. Let's give you some cross. Look at this massive, like there's snakes in the water. It's, Look it's, at it's it. It's fine, it's not gonna hurt us. That one's not poisonous. Oh yeah, what kind of snake is it? It's a, it's a, it's a black rattle. Rattlesnakes are poisonous. Yeah, well, that was no, you don't know. Like, hey, this is why I'm like, I'm just worried it's about you. Lost. It's gonna be fine. You just, I just, I just wanna get back sooner than later. Oh my God, it's crawling up the side of the, yeah, because you're scared and you won't admit to me that I'm you saw scared. like that you saw oh something God, back there. Okay, you know what? Maybe I did see something back there, and I do want to fucking get back a little sooner than later. Okay, that's it. I should have like I'm. S 
I should have brought my phone. Yeah. I like I should have brought like I, I don't know. Well, I we, should have brought my I, phone and my nut. I like I never like I'm trying to be all gung ho and then it's like the one time I need it, it's like I'm just like really frustrated well, with the, myself the right news, now. The good news is that we cross this log and we'll get back 30 minutes faster. We'll take you know, 30 yeah. minutes off of our 3-hour hike back, okay? Well, what would Coleridge do, I guess? He crossed the I, log. Yeah, I know. So, go cross. Does it look good over there? All right. Okay. So I just crossed over the log and halfway through me crossing Victor, of course, decided to go ahead and now I can't find him. So I'm a little bit concerned right now. Um, and I guess you'll fucking find this footage when I turn up dead. Uh, but I don't know why he always has to go ahead like that because I did not have I don't know the map as well as he does so I don't know what to fucking do I'm getting a really creepy vibe from the woods right now as well like I just don't feel comfortable and like I know it's that thing where you're never supposed to look behind you um because you won't see anything but if like, you won't see anything, but, like, if you don't see anything, you'll still get even more, like, paranoid and stuff. And you'll just have to keep looking behind you. So, I don't know. I have, like, a little bit of water. I don't trust the water that's in the river. And I just don't know, like, I'm hoping that he brought us close enough to the car with this brilliant shortcut of his that that I'll be able to find my way back because I don't want to cross the log again because it'll just confuse me even more. And I'm not lying, I'm a little bit panicked. Oh, hell no. This isn't the same log. I didn't cross the river again. Um. Okay. Okay. It's probably a different tree. Okay, it can't be too far from the end of the day now. Um, and I'm walking a little bit faster now because I feel like I'm definitely getting followed. Um, I know he walks 15 miles a day, 
Coleridge does. So, God, I don't even want to say his name right now. Um, and honestly, I don't remember being in this part of the forest before. That sachet of cheese is definitely... I don't know. I've never seen anything like that before, so I don't really know how to react to it. But I just have to keep going. I just have to keep going. It's night now. still out in the woods and I just want to apologize to um, to Victor's mom and to my mom um, I guess to Donna Tart, since if she puts out a fourth novel, I'll probably never read it. Um, I'm just sorry to everybody involved. I should have been smarter. I should have brought my phone with me. I should have brought a knife so I could defend myself. And I don't know if it'll give me any credit, but I'm sorry for every time that I laughed at Coleridge losing his shit over his older brother stealing his cheese. It's not funny. Cheese is never funny. Um, Victor. I don't wish he'd come back. I don't think he's coming back though. I don't think I'm coming back either. Um, I'm sorry I could never upload this reading vlog. I hope that somebody finds this footage and uploads it my extremely underappreciated channel. Um, I think my only regret is that I wasn't more of a hater on booktube. Um, um, I'm just gonna I don't know what that was. Um, I'm just gonna stay here, try to see in the dark, and I guess try to wait until till morning. Um, I guess that's it. Bye.